Hello everyone, my name is B. Combs Heinz. I'm a PhD student in Dr. Cameron Ainsworth's lab here at the College of Marine Science. And today I will be telling the story of how we're working to assess changes in seagrass meadow ecosystems under various harmful algal bloom scenarios. This work is funded by the Florida Restore Act grant. And despite the fact that I'm giving this presentation to you today in sweatpants surrounded by dishes and my dog, I would like you to picture me instead as I am in the lower left hand corner looking professional and in my office at CMS. I'll be outlining our project proposal and some preliminary results. I'll start with the background, the larger questions that we seek to answer, a little about model structure and our study area. Our methods can be divided into three subgroups or smaller questions that we have to answer in order to get to the larger question. First, where is seagrass? How do we represent distribution in the model? Who lives there? What is the community structure? And I've highlighted this portion because, I, as you'll see today, I've spent a lot of time in this question today. Um, finally, Atlantis. What are the components of Atlantis that we'll be manipulating and working with in order to answer this question? Finally, I'll wrap up with a summary with some implications and some future work. The two questions that we seek to answer are, can we use ecosystem modeling to accurately predict ecosystem changes, especially for indicator and focal species, in different harmful algal bloom scenarios? And two, how might seagrass mitigate these effects? The Gulf of Mexico supports a large and biodiverse marine ecosystem that humans rely on for survival. It spans subtropical and tropical waters. Much of the intertidal and coastal ecosystem of the Gulf of Mexico depends on seagrass meadows. They are a keystone of coastal biology, providing critical nutrients and habitats to fisheries, as well as many physical benefits like carbon capture and sediment stabilization. These meadows are especially sensitive to nutrient pollution, which can lead to toxic algal blooms like red tide or seafloor shading. In Florida and much of the Gulf, seagrass restoration is the primary management action used to combat nutrient pollution. A byproduct of this work will be an assessment of the cost and benefit of restoration efforts on ecosystems in light of these environmental changes. My advisor, Dr. Ainsworth, and I are developing the Atlantis Gulf of Mexico ecosystem model further in order to reflect seagrass communities and habitat. The model area is the entire Gulf of Mexico represented here. Polygons shown are the distinct ecological and environmental and geological areas within the model. This is our best representation of the complexity of such a large ecological system. While the outputs of this study will focus on the West Florida shelf on the right, we must model changes to the entire ecosystem as it represents a connected system. The Atlantis Gulf of Mexico model is an end-to-end -end ecosystem model, which means that all of the energy and nutrients are recycled throughout the model. Using this type of structure, we can assess the direct and indirect impacts of seagrass coverage. These can include changes in prey availability and quality, as well as changes in predation risk. There is a growing understanding in science that in order to have a holistic picture of the sensitivity of what we would call commercially important and endangered and threatened species, we must attempt to understand the entire abiotic and biotic system that they are a part of that we all are a part of. As you can see by this schematic, um, this model has a food web component, a biogeochemistry submodel, a climate and hydrology submodel, and we will be focused on the habitat portion of this model as well. The Florida Restore Act grant on which we are funded is specifically interested in these functional groups listed here. These are endangered and threatened species, or they could be considered indicators of habitat health and stability. Focal species for this study include the green turtle, the Kemp's Ridley turtle, dolphins, the West Indian manatee, diving birds, and surface feeding birds. And the reason for the kind of weird uh, structure of the names of those groups, like some are species and some are larger groups, is that the Atlantis, the Atlantis model groups similar species into what are called functional groups. So what you see on the left are indicative of specific um, functional groups that are ecologically similar. All right, on to methods. 
To help answer the question, where is seagrass? One of our grant collaborators directed me to this report by the Gulf of Mexico Alliance on the current state of seagrass in the Gulf and future needs. They held a workshop, which was a joint effort of the US Geological Survey, Wetlands and Aquatic Research Center, a private company called CNL World, the EPA, the Gulf of Mexico Alliance, and NOAA, to, in which they compiled seagrass experts collective knowledge and assessment recommendations in order to try to develop a better understanding of where seagrass is and support continued study of seagrass habitats and related ecosystems. They also came up with recommendations for baseline monitoring. What I learned is that the environmental conditions, sources of anthropogenic disturbances and the intra and interannual biophysical characteristics of meadows can produce extreme and variable signals in seagrass systems which makes it difficult to define, define a baseline or a reference condition. In addition to that, uh, in-situ monitoring is relatively infrequent and covers small targeted study areas due to its costs and the differing goals of the research projects conducting it. Seagrass distribution information was gathered by accessing the National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science GIS database. This combines geographic information from state and academic sources. Gulf of Mexico shapefiles, or polygons which delineate data that are geographically referenced, were queried for all of the Gulf, but here I'm just showing West Florida shelf data, which is from FWC and dates back to survey efforts starting in 1986. The resolution of this data varies and, is, and not all shapefiles contain information about the densities of seagrass meadows, those that do may describe density differently, uh, for example, using a more precise leaf area index method or by just eyeballing um, the area determine, to determine if it's patchy, patchy versus dense. For this reason, along with expert opinion that seagrass patchiness is not a critical influence on sea turtle abundance or other macrograzer abundance due to plasticity of their foraging behavior, we determined that for the purpose of this study, it would be appropriate to represent seagrass as a percent cover over model polygons instead of distinguishing between habitat types or species of seagrass. For this first attempt, we are more interested in seagrass effects on the landscape or the macro grazer scale. And we'll likely re revisit this question later by incorporating a predictive submodel because we do acknowledge that we may be missing fine scale interaction um, as seagrass meadows are very dynamic habitats that often do not, do not have a defined edge, but rather are gradients based on other environmental conditions. From the combined distribution map, we calculated the area of each polygon. In addition to the resolution of habitat connectivity as a caveat for seagrass representation in this model, we also acknowledge that some deeper seagrass meadows may not be accounted for as they are not well documented in the Gulf. Since we are not representing where seagrass can grow, just where it is measured, I made sure to increase the um, buffer size for each of the polygons, I'm sorry, each of the shapefiles of seagrass, so that when I calculated the area of seagrass beds that were right on the edge and maybe not quite overlapping an Atlantis polygon, I still accounted for some of that seagrass in that polygon because likely it is highly likely that it is it is there and we are underrepresenting it. This map shows um, seagrass coverage as discontinuous and continuous just for the sake of visualization. Um, and I also overlaid our Atlantis polygons that are over the West Florida shelf and are some new um, abundance information for diving birds, which are a known indicator of seagrass habitat. You can see the darker polygons indicate higher abundance of diving birds, uh, the darker purple and pink, and the lighter yellow and orange are lower abundance. So there's a clear overlap between their abundance and the seagrass information that we have for the West. So now that we have a better understanding of seagrass in the model, we need to describe the community structure. Who lives there? The focal groups of this study, um, the macrofauna and macro grazers that I described in the beginning, are commonly understood to be associated with seagrass primarily for foraging and hunting. Another reason why in this model it is crucial to gain an accurate understanding of how much habitat there is and where it is. 
However, many other ecosystem members whose numbers may also indirectly or directly impact the focal species, either through prey dynamics or changes in predator dynamics, are themselves uh, influenced by a loss or gain of seagrass habitat um, as a refugia or habitat that is either uh, protecting them from predators or acting as nursery habitat. In order to begin to understand the underlying community structure in Gulf estuaries, I consulted Florida Fish and Wildlife Fisheries Independent Monitoring data that contained species counts and associated environmental variables, including the essential variable of bottom vegetation cover. These data were gathered on a species level, but I was happy to learn that when I grouped them in Atlantis functional groups, 32 groups were represented. These data were originally collected to assess young of the year recruitment of reef fish species and is a collection of seasonal trawls in polyhaline seagrass beds. Because of their resolution, I decided to try an ordination method, but given their large sample size, I tested my methods using a random sample of 100 geographically distinct sites. To discern patterns in the community data from FIM, I used a multidimensional scaling technique. This type of technique can be used to visualize the level of similarity in independent sites uh, in a multivariable data set. It does this by displaying info contained within a calculated distance matrix where the similarities or differences between sites are measured. I used a non-metric multidimensional scaling, which finds both a non-parametric monotonic relationship between the dissimilarities in the site-by-site -site matrix, but also a location of each item in low dimensional space. The benefits of this type of rank approach is that it's well suited for abundance data and the user can specify a distance matrix. I used a Bray-Curtis distance matrix, a metric, which is a typical metric uh, used in ecology and community studies. This graph here shows how the goodness of fit changes with increasing dimensions. Um, typically, you want the least amount of dimensions um, because it's just easier to kind of visualize and um, pick patterns out of. But here, I, you know, I'm somewhere in between um, for four and six four to 10 dimensions, I'm in between um, what could be a, f a fair, some distances are misleading and a good confident um, goodness of fit, which kind of makes sense um, given that I only used 100 uh, points for this and those points were randomly selected. But for the purpose of testing this technique out and um, using it to find patterns in the community data and understand which functional groups uh, we might need to focus on for the model, uh, this seemed to work for now. Here are the results of that analysis. In other words, the Bray-Curtis site-by-site dissimilarity matrix kind of flattened and put into lower dimensional space. Um, you can see where zero and zero are in the center, that would be completely similar. Um, and as everything moves away from the center point, um, they become more similar to the ones around them, but less similar to the ones they're moving away from. And I want you to just keep an eye on where pinfish is located in this graph. Um, although there, it is kind of hard to discern some serious patterns from this, there are clearly some groupings happening. And I'm, I'm especially focused on pinfish, small demersal, and mullet as they're moving away from the center, um, not that close to each other, but at least on the same kind of axis trajectory away from the center. And this is just another way to visualize the goodness of fit, but as it's represented on at each site, um, or calculated for each site, the larger circles here don't have as strong of a fit with the original dissimilarity matrix. So here is where I overlaid environmental vectors into the ordination. Um, the arrows here point in the direction of a, mo of a more rapid environmental change. Um, these variables that you're seeing here that I um, pulled from the FIM data are mean high tide mark, distance to shore, 
salinity and temperature in the blue, uh, which uh, the blue lines indicate st uh, statistically significant. Um, the red lines are not statistically significant, but I believe that um, I would get a better idea of, of the, the impacts of, of those um, if I ran a larger sample size. Um, I, I brought pinfish out uh, to show the relationship between pinfish and bottom vegetation and salinity, um, which are characteristics of seagrass habitat. It is important to not treat results of this in further interpretation uh, because of the interdependence that is introduced when doing an ordination like this. Um, I will use the distance matrix that I calculated itself for further work. Um, I'm now working on doing a distance-based redundancy analysis just to get a clearer picture of what's going on and to try to quantify these the, the community structure of these habitats further. With the ordination, I was able to gain a better understanding of which functional groups were associated with bottom vegetation or with other environmental variables that are characteristic of seagrass beds. But in order to translate functional group and seagrass associations to a quantitative representation of how much biomass, or in this case abundance over effort, changes with habitat area, I need to do a predictive model. Here, seagrass associated functional groups, in this case I'm, I'm showing pinfish, were regressed over seagrass cover and other environmental variables. To do this, I used a generalized additive model, which is basically a linear model with a smoothing function. And for bottom vegetation, you can see a pretty clear indication of um, predicting an increase in biomass of pinfish over an increase in bottom vegetation percent cover. And those little blue dashes at the bottom represent data points. So that's a pretty, um, we got it, luckily had a nice um, good range of different uh, amounts of bottom vegetation to really hone in on that relationship. Depth is not a great relationship here because we only have depth up to one meter. Um, but salinity, uh, as this was a study that was focused on uh, polyhaline seagrass beds, you can see with increasing salinity, characteristic of increasing seagrass, you also have increasing pinfish. There are a lot of different levers that we can adjust in Atlantis to account for changes in habitat um, and how that influences the functional groups. But I wanted to talk about habitat dependency parameter um, that allows for a more sensitive habitat dependency among functional groups. Um, this is the equation that will be influenced by my um, work with the ordination and with the GAM. Um, so age structure groups can be sensitive to the level of habitat. Um, here we're talking about seagrass. And in this equation, cover amount is can be the average cover of biogenic and abiotic habitats or the uh, cumulative amount divided by the number of habitats that they are dependent on. So what's cool about Atlantis is you could have, a, currently we have 10 habitat types defined, and so you can set a habitat dependency parameter for each ha habitat type. And um, not only that, but the parameter can be a number greater than one um, to specify some kind of value uh, weighting. Um, another thing to keep an eye on here is that the uh, B cove parameter is specific to refugia, so animals that we know are um, have a strong association with refugia um, in seagrass beds can have that parameter adjusted. So this is part of the model tuning process that will be informed by um, some of the other statistical work that I talked about before. So another important Atlantis component to this work is to update biomass and recruitment numbers based on newly modeled distributions, especially for focal species. And this was actually one of the first things that was accomplished um, in, this, in this project. Um, in Atlantis, uh, we could force simulations using mortality, body growth, and recruitment modifiers in three dimensions, either polygon um, horizontally sp uh, or spatially within the polygon or in, in the depth layers. Um, and it's specifically important to update horizontal distributions for sea turtles, which were recently divided into seasonal and adult and juvenile distribution for the first time in this model. And anyone who knows 
sea turtle biology knows that they have very distinct life history phases. So it's, a, it's huge progress to um, represent um, those different uh, parts of, you know, treating those as, almost, as like different functional groups because they, they are, they, those different stages of sea turtle's life, whether it's uh, hatchling or juvenile or adult, um, are carried out in very different locations and in very different ways. And this work is, was done by one of our current collaborators um, on, a, on a previous, uh, another Restore Act grant um, named Arnaud Gluce. And he is actually, he completed um, a generalized additive model, um, which used environmental variables and um, data collected at random sampling sites throughout the Gulf in order to produce a new distribution maps, um, which you can see here were translated into our Atlantis functional, uh, I'm sorry, our Atlantis polygons. So a uh, quick summary, um, we're finishing up year one of the grant, um, tuning and updating parameters in the model. Simulations that we were moving on to now um, will include varying parameters that can be uh, specific to harmful algal bloom influence. Uh, some of these, for example, are light penetration, primary producer shift from seagrass to algae, hypoxia parameters, uh, liberation of nutrients due to red tide, and there's others as well. Some future work, uh, are, some of our collaborators are interested in other simulations, um, including changing sea level rise and then seeing how salinity and focal species are affected by that perhaps limiting seagrass near other important habitats that are favored by macrofauna. Um, and maybe a, a question that has been plaguing green turtle scientists for a while, um, will their increases in abundance due to regulations influence seagrass as it's kind of recovering in, in a lot of areas? Um, I also still would like to address the deeper seagrass. Um, I've tested a few different methods um, thanks to Dr. Who's remote sensing class this uh, last spring um, that are still I'm still pretty uh, new to but I show some promise um, in using Landsat remote sensing or a wider scale um, larger swath satellite remote sensing to maybe fill in some of the areas where we know there's deeper seagrass and we might not be accounting for it um, and perhaps even building a predictive model um, using environmental variables to better account for seagrass in them. All right and with that I just want to thank everyone this is my first time getting to participate in a grad student symposium and the organizers did an awesome job under these strange circumstances. Um, thanks to my advisor, my lab mates, my collaborators on this project, and of course the funding agency. Um, and you know, this is an incredibly difficult and dark and grief-filled time that we're living through right now and I'm in very grateful to our university and our specifically our CMS community just for the support and the stability through all of this um, and very thankful for Dr. Nahr and Sammy and all the my fellow grad students who have been so helpful in more ways than one. Um, if anyone's interested in collaborating to any degree or uh, critiquing uh, criticizing, questioning <laughs> this power, this uh, presentation or this work, you know, I'm all on all ears. Um, I'd love to work with any one of you and and pick your brains if that's something that you're into. Um, and happy to take any questions when the time comes. Thanks again, everyone.